Hello and welcome to part four. This year is Darren from Lone Forge Blades and I've been documenting a Damascus knife that he's been making right from start and it's going to be right to finish. I made a playlist and added three videos already just to make the billet so he can start on the knife. Now with that there you're going to be able to click on the link at the end and see the playlist if you're interested in seeing how it was constructed to this point. But I'm going to let you listen to Darren here and he will tell you what's going on this evening. Thanks Wayne. How are you doing tonight folks? So you guys saw that billet drawer. We got it out to about 9 inches, about 3 eighths of an inch thick. And then I cut it on an angle. Not this piece particularly, but uh, there's two pieces in the forge already. But I cut it on an angle like that. So that when I come down, I'm going to forge this up as the blade edge. And I'll squish this end down to draw out a tank. And instead of me talking about it a whole lot, me will just watch and then I watch to see how it develops. Stay tuned folks. See the lines in the billet now. Yeah, yeah. When I bring that around, that's gonna that, that whole pattern will sway out with the blade edge the whole way out. Then I'm not cutting it off when it comes time to grind it. Nice, nice. Stir the tang into that and wait. So I'll draw that down a little smaller, a little thinner, I can get a better bite on it with these tongs. I'm having a hard time hanging on to it.
of that there is just to uh, make sure they're both exactly square on it. Yep, make sure that everything's that they line up the same on both sides, Wayne, and I've lined it up with the square itself. I'll take most of the meat off with this guy here and then I'll clean it up with the chainsaw file. So I'll make sure that these edges down in this corner stay a little bit rounded. If you get any right angles on a on a tank, you could have a spot where you could have stress risers. Yep. And we don't want that, so I'll make sure they're rounded up a little bit, fairly close to square, and I'll be able to do any touch-ups later after we do the heat treat. So I'll make sure that everything's fairly close when I just go and start doing my grinds. Scribe for center line so that I know when I do my grind on this blade that it's gonna go right down the center and then I can get my get my plunge lines equal on both sides of the blade. And of course the black markers, so when, just, you, when, you, when you scribe down through you'll have a nice it's a good replacement for layout die. A lot of guys would get into the blue layout die. Uh, I couldn't be bothered. I just use that, and now I use a high-tech method <laughs> of uh, drill bit. Lay the blade down on its side. I'll catch the center. I'll give it a good scratch. Flip it over. Give it another good scratch. And that pretty well shows me the dead center down the middle of that blade. So when I start my grind, I'll bring my grinds in this way equal height, equal width on both sides, I know I got center. So there you can see your center lines. Yeah. Now I'm going to throw my file guide back on. I use this to get me started so that I make sure that my plunge lines are equal on both sides and once I got a start established, I'll remove that and I'll go by hand. Just freehand the grinds from there till I'm done. Them in there now, bud. 
So you see, you see this guy here, he's still got the big broad stripes and they just go straight down through the through the side of the knife. Yep. This one here where I've ground down in it, and I've exposed the center of that billet, exposed the core. It's giving me nice U-shapes at the top, nice U-shapes at the bottom, starry in the center. Same on the other side. We'll grind down into that side a little further, you'll see the same almost pattern in that. But you can see where the broadbands crossed over themselves in the middle. And this guy here still doesn't have a whole lot of action to it. So that's the reason why we want to grind down into some of them instead of forging them in. So I'll have you a little closer to get the light on those. There we go. Yeah, you can see a big difference. That's pretty cool, man. Very cool. Touch mark on here, high tech method. I use this here 100 pound magnet. Eyeball it as close as I can to square. A couple of degrees, not going to make a whole lot of difference. Somebody might see it. I set my stamp down in there nice and square. Make sure I'm fairly vertical. And the magnet holds that. And, and then I'm just yeah. going to set the whole thing, and then the magnet, magnet sort of just pulls down equally the whole way. And I get the big, big hammer. A lot of guys try to do this hot, I find it's really hard in the knuckles. So I'll hit them cold and then I go back, I can straighten anything out after we're ready. You good to go? Yeah. Hold it right there. I'll zoom in on that. Oh, that toe did nice, man. Yep, now we'll do another. Number two. It always gives me a good stamp, Wayne, and I'm not that concerned about losing my temper. A lot of guys will try to stamp them hot. Yeah. I'd hate, I'd hate to uh, take the temper out of that stamp. Yeah. So I, I stamp them cold, and I know that guy's staying hard. This steel is fairly soft at this point in the game. So now we... Uh, do a little bit of cleanup, make sure that I got no real nasty stuff on there, and then we'll go for some heat treat. Moving right along, man. We're coming now. Okay, anyway, it's time to hurt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this guy up to non-magnetic. I'm going to check against my magnet. Like we talked about normalizing, I want to do the same thing. I want to watch that color when, the, when that steel loses its complete magnetism. I want to stay at that temp for a few minutes, and then I'm going to go right for a quench. I got that forward roll right back, mostly taking residual heat off the off the sides. A little bit more through that heel. Good and hard. Nice and hard. Nice and straight. Now let's get him in the oven. extremely hard and extremely brittle. We don't want the knife that brittle because then you're going to get chips and uh, it's going to break. That's what's going to happen. So what we'll do with that now is we'll temper it. And depending on what we want for hardness, what we're going to choose for a tempering. 
for an all-around hunting knife, what we're going for, a temper around, at around 400 Fahrenheit, it's going to take a lot of that brittleness out of, out of that knife, and it's going to make it sharpenable, it's going to give it a little bit of flexibility, and, and workable. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot safer, and uh, it'll take a lot of the brittleness and hardness out of it. How long do you have to leave it in there? I do two cycles at 400 Fahrenheit. Some guys do one, some guys will do three. Um, I've had good luck with two, two cycles, and the uh, age-old Dodge has never fallen in love with a knife until it's been tempered at least twice. Hey. <laughs> so we're, we're in there now, we're going to wait an hour, and then we'll pull them out, let them cool down to uh, room temperature, and then stick them back in, and we'll, we'll temper them for another one hour at 400 Fahrenheit. I'm not sure what that is in Celsius for, for you folks that are doing it in, uh, in Celsius, but Google will translate that for us. For sure.